All gave some, some gave all. Some would march on, others would fall. There are no winners in war when you consider the cost. You cannot justify the thousands of lives for our own that were lost. Wars leave scars that in time may fade, but not without taking a toll. However, the deepest wounds are those that scar the very heart and soul. For those that saw action during wartime, I'm sure without a doubt, they've had to live with the memories of fallen comrades, their brothers, someone they cared deeply about, and all the families left behind with only their memories to carry them through, also paying the price of freedom won for me and you. We are all aware that times have changed, and yet there are certain things we must never forget. Be proud of our flag, and long may she wave, and long may we remember what so many gave. I'm Mike Marino. I'm a chaplain in the United States Navy. I currently hold the rank of captain. I recall uh, when I was in uh, Kuwait, ready to go to Iraq in 2003. We had not crossed the line yet, but we were being prepared to do so. It was almost the middle of the night, maybe 12, 1 o'clock. And all of a sudden, from behind us, the sky was filled with rockets. You could see them, hundreds of rockets going uh, from us to, uh, to Iraq. And at first it was, wow, that's cool. Wow, that's amazing. And then the realization came to us that those rockets were going to land somewhere. <laughs> and someone was going to have a very bad evening. That's when the reality of combat and war hit me at least and many of my sailors and my marines. So I recall the night that the Iraq war started, uh, the night where the sky was filled with rockets. And for me, that was the actual start of the war. There's also something I'd like to mention, and that's the support of our families. Uh, my wife, Lisa, is a Navy wife. And I just want to highlight again the fact that uh, sailors, Marines, soldiers, and airmen, there's no way we can do what we're called to do without the support of our families. They're the ones that wait at home and wait to hear from us, whether we're deployed in peacetime or if we're in combat. But the weight of that weighs upon them so, so very much. But they're always there supporting us, uh, hugging us, uh, listening to us. And so for both those who are active serving as well as those who are veterans and uh, their spouses and their families have them back full time, uh, we just would like to say again, thank you so, so very much for all that you do. There is a, a humorous story I'd like to share with you. Uh, there are times in the Marine Corps where we invite families to come to the base and it's called Jane Wayne Day. When our wives are able to ride in tanks, uh, they eat MREs, meals ready to eat. And so they spend time uh, wearing our uniforms and seeing what it is their husbands do. Uh, and there was one moment where the wives were taken to a rifle simulation center. And they lie prone and they have a weapon. It's, um, it's kind of like a a, uh, it's a video game. So a video game rifle doesn't shoot real good bullets, but you see a, a scene on there, you pull the trigger and it, tri and it records how you did. And as my wife was uh, getting ready to take uh, part in this, one of the Marines said, ma'am, this is what your husband does. And my wife said, not my husband. And the Marine goes, no, 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 really. Your husband does this. She goes, nope, 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 not my husband. And the rain looked at her quizzically and said, well, of course, your husband is part of this unit. And she goes, he's the chaplain. And the Marine lit up, goes, oh, chaps. Yeah, okay, yeah, I, yeah. all right, Mrs. Chaps, we'll take care of you. Uh, but for chaplains, one of the most important and most rewarding things that we have is that close 
bond with our Marines and with our sailors. And uh, the day that that Marine instantly recognized me, uh, just told me again that I was doing the right thing, trying to be with my Marines. And I think that also got across to my wife as well. Okay, my name is Rick Thomas uh, from Bluefield, Nebraska, and uh, I was enlisted. I enlisted in uh, May 24th, 1965, when I graduated from high school and went right into the military. And uh, I joined, I wanted to join the U.S. Marine Corps because the war of uh, 1965 broke out in Vietnam and I wanted to be one of the best. But when I was in the Marine Corps office, I noticed the United States paratrooper come walking in and want to know where the Army recruiter's office was. So I asked the uh, sergeant that was in the Marine Corps, I said, uh, who's that guy? Who's that guy? And they said, uh, well, he's, uh, he's airborne. And I liked the way he was dressed. Uh, so I decided, well, I was going to go ahead and leave the Marine Corps and go over to the U.S. Army, and I signed up for Airborne Unassigned 11B2P, which is Combat Infantry, United States Paratrooper. I served my time in January of 1966 when I went to Vietnam. I wanted to share that my first jump in Vietnam was with my division, the 101st Airborne Division, which we jumped into uh, uh, Vietnam, and uh, I spent a whole year out in the boonies and jungles of Vietnam. We did ambush on Ho Chi Minh Trail because of a lot of concentration coming in from North Vietnam, for North Vietnam, so they set us up to set up an ambush. When we set up an ambush, they told us to cover up with our, uh, our uh, stuff that was carrying on our back. Uh, and when we covered up, a plane flew over and dropped. Uh, it was just like it was raining, but it was Agent Orange. And when they dropped Agent Orange on us, you know, I didn't feel nothing then. You know, we got up and got in our ambush. But then after my tour in Vietnam, that's when I began to feel the, the effects of Agent Orange, you know. And uh, that Agent Orange, it affected me uh, with my heart. In 2005, they diagnosed me up to be in uh, Omaha with 100% disability because of my diabetes, my high blood pressure, my heart, my back. Uh, when, it, when it was my heart, it uh, the VA out of Norfolk, Nebraska, referred me to uh, a heart doctor here in Norfolk at Faith Regional. And he said, you know, Rick, he said, Mr. Thomas, he said, you're only living with 10% of your heart. So I had to uh, wear a life vest with a battery. So if I had a heart attack, that battery would kick it in and be alive. So I did that for a year, and then finally last year, they put in a heart pacer and a simulator into my, uh, uh, so if I had a heart attack, well, that simulator would kick it in, and I'd come down every now and then for uh, evaluations and checking out my heart. And uh, last year, I thought sure that it was gonna be my time I talked with my family and uh, had my funeral all arranged, my wakes, and it turned out that I survived. When I got to Vietnam, and it was just a, a just learning, just learning what uh, a war was all about was the reason why I signed up. But then now, with all my health conditions. I would probably say it, I'd do it again.
My name is Lonnie Ford. I live in Pender, Nebraska. My son, Joshua Andrew Ford, joined the Nebraska Army National Guard uh, as a junior. Uh, he was in for about a year and a half before they got their call uh, that they were going to be nationalized and were going to go to serve uh, in the Iraqi war. Uh, when Josh enlisted, uh, I was teaching, and uh, a friend of mine was the recruiter out of Wayne, Nebraska. And uh, Josh said, I'm going to go talk to Brad. And I said, you're going to do what? He goes, yeah, I'm going to go join. And I said, well, you want me to go with you? He goes, nope, I can do it myself, old man. And so he came back in 15 minutes later, papers that I had to sign, uh, and that began his short military career. Uh, Josh's unit uh, was in Iraq from uh, about October or November uh, until his death in July of 2006. Uh, we were informed of his death uh, on July 31st. Uh, my wife woke up uh, and said there's cop car sitting outside the house. And uh, I knew right then uh, what was going to happen. So I went, well, and I told her, well, <clears throat> they're probably there for the drug house across the street. But when I opened our garage door, there was uh, two uh, army chaplains and a sergeant uh, standing on our sidewalk. And I walked over and Pounded on my pickup a couple times and then invited them in. And they told us that uh, Josh and the young man that was with him uh, in the truck that he drove uh, had been hit by a IAD. And Josh was killed instantly. And the young man with him uh, was severely injured. Uh, we later on met him, and uh, he's an amputee now. He lost uh, half of the leg and most of the muscle on his other leg. Probably the hardest thing was uh, the night after we were informed of Joshua's death, uh, the chaplain was told my wife that she had to do the driving to go inform uh, the rest of my children and the rest of my family of our loss. And we spent about nine to 10 hours on the road. Uh, we drove over to Wayne, told two of my daughters uh, what had happened. We went down to North Bend, told my mother and uh, my brothers and my sister. Then my sister drove us to Omaha, where we told my uh, other daughter uh, of our loss. And then uh, we went back to North Bend, then back to Wayne, and then back to Pender. Uh, it took us it was about 10 days, if I remember right, from the time Josh was killed till the time that he was buried. And uh, when the funeral took place, there were so many people that showed up that they had to put a loudspeaker outside of the church uh, for those who could not get into the church to be able to uh, hear the ceremony. Uh, there was about oh, 170 patriarchy writers that uh, showed up that day. They escorted us out to the cemetery uh, where then uh, we went through uh, the military uh, service uh, with the 21 gun salute and the taps and uh, went back there to uh, the Leech Hall and uh, had to answer some more questions uh, for the reporters and uh, went home and spent the rest of the day then. Uh, with our family. We have an all-volunteer military now, and the individuals that are joining, men, women, young, old, uh, are making a great sacrifice for this nation, and they need to be respected. Their families are making a sacrifice. Uh, you know, because most of those individuals have been deployed once, twice, three times, and uh, they need all the support uh, that they could get.
My name is Bill Jefferson. I'm enlisted in the Nebraska Army National Guard, actually the California Army National Guard in 1978. Uh, spent 35 years in the National Guard, majority of the time in Nebraska. Uh, I was 18 years old when I enlisted. Uh, initially, I went to uh, military police school in Fort McClellan, Alabama. Uh, then I was in California, and when I moved back to Nebraska, I became part of the 1st uh, of the 134th Infantry Battalion. I was in the maintenance division and spent about seven, eight years here in Omaha and working full time out of Meade, Nebraska, the unit training equipment site there. Then I got the flying bug, applied for flight school, went to Fort Wrecker, Alabama for a year, and became a helicopter pilot. I spent the rest of my career with the uh, Nebraska Army National Guard Aviation Facility down in Lincoln. 24th Medical Company Air Ambulance, the second of the 135th General Support Aviation Battalion, and the first of the 376th Aviation Battalion. I uh, retired in 2013, and I live in Norfolk, Nebraska. I had served five deployments when I was overseas. went to Desert Storm in 1990. I went to Bosnia in 1999. We went to El Salvador for a humanitarian mission in 2005. In 2006-2007, I was over in Iraq. And in 2011, I went to Kosovo. Uh, best thing about my career is being part of a medical evacuation unit. We were always helping people. It was always nice to be able to see the fruits of your labor. You had soldiers come up to you years later and say, hey, you guys flew me. Thank you. It's really, really makes you feel good. One of the worst days was when we were in Bosnia. And the way the people reacted to each other over there, they would bomb and mine entire villages. You would fly over these places and drive by them, and there were no birds, there were no animals, there were just empty shells of buildings. And it was really hard to understand how people could could do those sort of things to each other. Uh, made very many friends. I'm still in touch with a few of the people I went to basic training with. Uh, a lot of the guys that I went to flight school with in 1985, I still made contact with. And then, of course, all my all my friends from the unit down in Lincoln. We have a real tight group of people. We always stay in touch, and we take, still keep, take care of each other to this day. I'm just proud to serve my country and proud to uh, take care of soldiers and take care of people. I'm Gail Freeberg. I was finishing my nursing education in Omaha when I decided to join the military. My military career lasted almost 26 years and I now live in Norfolk. <clears throat> As I was finishing nursing school, I wasn't sure where I wanted to go or where I wanted to work, but I knew that I wanted to go somewhere. A friend was going into the Navy, so after doing my research, I decided to go in with her under the buddy system. As a nurse, I received a direct commission as an officer in the United States Navy Nurse Corps. I worked in several different areas of nursing until I settled into my specialty as an operating room nurse. During my career, I had nine different assignments that included both the East and the West Coast, the Gulf Coast, and overseas in Okinawa and Yokosuka, Japan, plus two opportunities to further my education. I enjoyed all of my duty stations, especially seeing new areas of the country and the world and meeting new people. It was quite an adventure for a farm girl from a small Nebraska town. The highlight of my career was being deployed on the hospital ship USNS Mercy during Operation Desert Shield and Storm from August of 1990 through March of 1991. I left my home in San Diego on less than 24 hours notice and was deployed for seven months. I had to learn how to live on a ship. We had numerous drills 
including man overboard, abandoned ship, and mass casualties. As an operating nurse, I was in charge of the training for all of our 60 uh, nurses and technicians. After we transited the Pacific and the Indian Oceans, we crossed the Straits of Hormuz into the Persian Gulf, where we remained close to Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates. This was an entirely different part of the world that I never expected to see, but I enjoyed it and I learned so very much there. <clears throat> the biggest challenge of my military time actually came at the end of my career. I had planned to retire in November of 2001, but after the events of 9-11, the various services enacted a stop loss, which prevented military members in critical fields from getting out or retiring. My operating room specialty was considered critical, and just 10 days before my planned retirement, I was retained for an additional nine months, and then I was able to retire in August of 2002. As a nurse, when I left the military, I had numerous options. I worked on a nursing computer program in the same-day surgery center and even taught nursing school. Since I had my retirement income, it allowed me to explore other areas of nursing and I learned so very much from those experiences as well. Going into the military was the right fit for me. All of the patients and the people that I met and the places that I was, have been stationed and traveled to have made me who I am today. Given the opportunity, I would do it all over in a heartbeat. It was a great experience and I would recommend it to anyone. Thank you. I was in the Army, and I was about 18 years old when he drafted me. And so I had quite a, quite a journey. <laughs> but I was in the tail end of the war, about 44, 45. My brother, he was in, the, in 42, he was drafted in 42 and, and he had it really rough and they originally told me and my brother younger brother and that, that we could uh, we wouldn't have to be drafted in war if we just we worked on the railroad and neither one of us want to work on a railroad so so we had a long journey from Fort Leavenworth. We went down in the service to Fort Leavenworth. We went out to California. It took about two days on a train. When we first got there, I remember, oh, it was hot. It was hot, it wasn't used to that. When we got out to California, uh, took that 18 basic training and I I got about 16, 17 basic training in then I got sick and got in the hospital and uh, they I was in there and I just where I was started enjoying it. And then I had to go back out and finish my basic training. So I finished basic training and ready to go overseas, over to uh, the Aleutian Islands. And they stuck me back in the hospital again. I remember the first time going out there and I you know, looking at all those uh, jeeps are driving around and all those stuff are going on. And, but I remember the first time the Japanese were shooting at me and shooting at the whole bunch of people up there on the hill. 
and I wasn't used to it. And the old boy told me to hit the, hit the ground, get in the ground. And so after that, I got pretty well used to it. So we kind of heard that the war was going to end. So, so we had a, an old paddle tape, just electricity. That's all we had for radio. And a guy found on the radio that the war was ended. And uh, in the meantime, somebody was saying there was thousands of people of Japanese surrendering. Oh, it really felt good. It really felt good. And on closing, I just want to convey our appreciation and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, veterans, and to those who shared their stories and for standing up for old glory. We all know freedom isn't free. There's a huge price paid for all our liberties. God bless America, land of our birth, and God bless America, the greatest nation on earth.